Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Prudence Townsend and I am part of the Open Implants team. I am very happy to welcome you to our Height Matters webinar. The webinar this morning will be led by CBT Pamela Hanneman. Pam has been in the dental industry for about 30 years, and I've had the pleasure of working with her for the last six, and hopefully there will be many more. If you are a CDT, please drop your first and last name and CDT number in the chat, in the Zoom chat, so that we can get the uh, credit hour properly assigned to you. And we will have time for questions at the end. However, if you think of any questions during the webinar, go ahead and pop those in the chat as well. We will try to answer any of those. But I do have a feeling that Pam's presentation will answer most of your questions. Pam, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Prudence. Oh my gosh, 30 years. That hit me hard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Lots of um, experiences throughout those, those years. But um, and all of you if, you, if you do know Prudence or you don't, um, it's just kind of amazing working with her. Um, awesome human being and very knowledgeable. So very glad to be working with her again. Um, so welcome to Height Matters. Like Prudence said, I'm Pam Hanneman. Uh, some of you may recognize me from my days educating and lecturing for Zon Dental. Um, I may have even come to your lab to help with digital materials and centering. Um, I like to take a very down to earth and practical approach to education so that what I share can be util utilized daily in the laboratory and be used on our everyday cases. Um, I, I want the education to actually have an impact. Um, so after, uh, Wow, let's see, a year off from training. Uh, I'm quite pleased to be back and interacting again and to be able to educate and support the Open Implants proprietary 510K cleared components. So this company is very personal and dear to my heart. Um, This company, Open Implants, was, was created by my mentors uh, from back in the CAP days. So that, that is why it is so special and dear to me. Um, and it is also uh, with great passion that I present this webinar to you all. Um, passion sprinkled with just um, a little bit of nerves since this is my first time back in over a year. Thank you, COVID. Um, so if I stutter a little bit along the way, it's just my nerves kicking in, but we should be fine. And no matter, how, no matter how many times I do these, I still get nervous. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen once more with you all, and we'll jump into the webinar. All righty. So yes, that's me. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, height is also a personal challenge. This is my six foot son, Robert. Uh, without that rock to stand on, our faces wouldn't even be close to the same level in this photo. I'd be more in his armpit. Um, when height matters your whole life, you tend to get very resourceful. And so now let's seriously really dive in. Um, in today's webinar, we're going to cover three key elements of abutment height um, in regards to how it affects the support for the crown, how to select height for adequate clearance, and increase the bond strength. We are also going to cover the three key elements of cuff height and or gingival height, whatever you prefer to call it. Um, so why surface texture is so important to tissue health. Um, biocompatibility bio of cement and the cementation line, and of course, emergence profile. As dental professionals, we are faced with challenges every single day. Um, seven challenges for the doctor are determining prosthetic design, the patient force factors, bone density, implant position and number of implants, 
um, if there's going to be more than one, maybe you're doing it all on four. Um, implant size, available bone, and implant placement. So what the doctor predetermines during his planning sets the laboratory's path in motion. The technician must choose safe and compatible components and accessories for a functional and aesthetic outcome. Some of you may have the opportunity to consult and advise uh, with the doctors you work with for case planning. I always think it's best. Um, I always think that's the best approach. It helps the doctor when he's planning angle and placement. If he has insight into what the technicians also need for aesthetics, um, and, and really the team approach is the best approach. Uh, it also um, builds a relationship based on mutual trust, uh, both dentist and lab working together for one common goal. So, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in that situation um, where the doctor is open um, to collaborating, I, I highly recommend taking him up or her up on that opportunity. So the doctor presents the challenge based on how well they have planned for the top seven considerations we just went over. Now the case comes to the lab. It's now up to the lab and the technician to select the best and most appropriate components to create the abutment and also the restoration. Um, in, the, in this case today, we're talking about a screw retained crown or screw retained crowns. Open Implants has created safe and compatible accessories to help you provide the best options for the patient. So I really wanna stress my next statement. Um, I am a, I'm a CDT, a ceramist. Uh, I am a technician just like all of you. And what we do, we consider our craft, our art, um, and it's very personal to us. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes we really do focus a little bit more on the aesthetic outcome and we need to focus a little bit more um, on uh, the, the function and the longevity of the restoration and the impact that it has on, on the patient, uh, what we decide to do with it. So every patient's safety and satisfaction should be at the forefront of our decision-making. Aesthetics are very important, like I said. However, the aesthetics alone are not gonna ensure a safe and, a safe and effective restoration. Um, effective solutions start with the correct abutment height to support the final designed restoration. We have to be able to support the restoration. <clears throat> So if you look at the, the photo on the left, um, as we know and experience daily, it isn't often that we receive the ideal case. Uh, more often than not, there are challenges regarding height, angle, strength, there's calls back and forth to the doctor. Um, so on the left here, uh, we have an example of an implant um, placed with uh, the ideal crown height space or CHS. Um, and that's, you know, an average about 12 millimeters on the substructure and restoration. Um, as we move towards the anterior where there's less um, force, biting force, uh, you can have a little bit taller. But when we start going back into the molars, especially the first lower molars, um, we, we really need to be very cautious of, of height and how we're supporting that restoration. The lower uh, first molar is actually the highest remake uh, crown. You know, naturally, that's the, that's the area where there's the most force. So that's the ideal world. Um, on the right, we have the extremes that we, were we are challenged with daily. Um, given these extremes, you know, we, we have to think about what can we do within our power? You know, we can't control where and how the, the implant was placed. It's now our job to, to take it from there, right? So what we can do is select 
the appropriate height bases to accommodate and support the height of the predicted restoration. With the variety of heights that we would need to have in stock, um, that would call for a lot of inventory, um, a lot of organization and, and management of that inventory. Um, you, know, you can't just go with one height. One height isn't appropriate for every case. Um, if we notice in this photo to the right, all the tie bases are the same height for each crown. Um, that's really not the best option. It is far superior to have tie bases in various heights to support the crown's various needs or height challenges. In order to do so, the lab would have to have a lot of uh, inventory in stock or place multiple orders on demand as they, you know, you, we can't predict what's gonna come in the door tomorrow, right? Um, and, you know, it's obviously very important to have what you need when you need it. Um, if you don't have it and you have to place that order, that slows up the case, that can delay the case, you're waiting on it, takes time for people to order it, unpack it, put it into inventory. It's just very labor intensive. So the OI system is intentionally evo um, evolved. So certified dental technicians, real technicians designed the products based on the needs of the everyday technician and to eliminate obstacles. Um, our goal is always to simplify lab operations and reduce costs while maintaining a high level of quality. We're not compromising there um, by providing safe components that are customizable. So one component that allows you to customize to your need in a matter of seconds, and it really just really like a couple seconds, is the multi-height engaging and non-engaging tie bases. Um, so with one tie base, you can customize the height to either four, five, six, eight, or 10 millimeters, depending on what your needs are. So again, that's one piece of inventory that you can use in five different ways. Um, all of those heights are preloaded into the OI library. Um, so no matter how you customize the tie base, the height is already available um, when setting up your case in 3Shape and or ExoCAD. Um, yes, one part that can facilitate anywhere from four to 10 millimeters. And yes, I said 10. Um, and uh, all the way on the right, you can see, um, I just wanted to show you that the options in the library are there and, and preloaded and it's easy, easy as that. Um, you just have to select what you're, what you're gonna go with. Again, everything we do is trying to make things better and easier. So you may be thinking, do I need a 10 millimeter chimney? Um, the reason for extreme height is that proactive care that is needed to prevent bone and tissue loss is rarely provided at the time of extraction. Um, I'm not a dentist, I don't claim to be one. I'm a technician and again, I've been doing this for 30 years. So there's a lot of knowledge I've gathered along the way um, and opinions I have formed. Um, I'm not a doctor, but this is my opinion. Um, if bone generation, regeneration were addressed at the time of extraction and given time to heal, we would see far less bone loss and tissue resorption um, we, like we see in the above um, three photos. Um, we would also see less path of insertion issues from drifting adjacent teeth. Um, so nobody loves that dreaded black triangle, but when you have teeth on either side of your restoration that are tilted in, you obviously have to seat it. The contacts have to be, you know, have to fit through that path. But then when you get down to the gingival area, you have more space than what was at the incisal and you end up with these black triangles. Um, we try to, you know, mask that or hide the length of the crown with pink porcelain. I've done plenty of that myself. Um, but I do think that um, unlike when, so I, I have a missing number 30. Um, and I was really young when that, when that was removed. And at the time, 
um, there wasn't even like a second thought about what should we do, you know, maybe she'll want to have an implant in the future. None of that. Um, so yeah, so my adjacent teeth are tilted in and, and I've thought about having an implant. Um, but I'm in the situation where my teeth have drifted and I'm thinking, I don't want an implant that's going to be ugly and have those triangles and it'll be hard to clean and I'll forever be playing with it. I know it. I know myself. It would, it would bother me every minute I was awake. Um, so the only option for me really would be to get some uh, bone grafting. And also um, I would have to uh, have my adjacent teeth also modified or prepped um, so that I could have a proper path of insertion. So, um, so we talked about the black, black triangles, but I do think like these days, unlike when I was younger, there is better patient education and awareness, um, not just because of the internet, but I, I just think in general, we care more about our health now. Um, and we think about being proactive, um, and implants are definitely, um, much more common and placed more frequently. Um, but there is still a large portion of patients that present um, with similar bone loss, um, like the above, above photo. Um, you know, without grafting, that's going to be a really, really long crown, probably going to have to add pink tissue to mask, uh, to make it not look so long, uh, make it look like there is some natural tissue there. I'm hoping the patient is going to have those restorations um, replaced on either side as well. We can see that um, they've had some tissue recession since um, those crowns were placed. So when proactive treatment is given, you can see the difference quite clearly. Um, preventing the bone, preserving the bone, I apologize, allows for more ideal crown height space. Um, think about the quality and aesthetic outcome given each situation. For me, I would prefer the bottom picture 10 out of 10 times. Um, I know the, the hassle and the work that I'm going to have to put into if I'm restoring um, that top photo. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a struggle. You know, we always want to give a natural and um, acceptable looking crown for the patient. Um, and, you know, they can't foresee what that, they can't imagine what that's going to, to look like. Um, so hopefully they have a great dentist that's going to recommend the grafting um, and, and present to them um, in an understandable way, uh, the benefits of having that done. It's not just a benefit for us in the lab, it is a benefit for the patient and the longevity of that restoration. Okay, so same picture from the previous slide, top left there. Um, so on the top left corner shows what we're faced with. Notice the tie bases for every single one of those crowns are the same height. Take a minute to consider the forces placed on that shortest crown with the short base and that really tall crown with a short base. Um, so the, the tall one compared to the shorter one, it's going to uh, have to undergo far greater um, forces in the mouth. Uh, so the, the greater the force, we need greater support and strength and retention on the um, substructure that we're working with, in this case, a tie base. Um, so I have a, a sample case here, the, the three photos. Hope you can see my cursor on the bottom. So uh, this case was completed by one of our amazing customers. Their challenge uh, was a molar implant with some uh, bone and tissue recession. Very common for what we see every single day. The implant is placed uh, more than one millimeter subgingival. Uh, not ideal, but again, what we're faced with. Um, would a standard short tie base work? Maybe for a little while. 
uh, but the mastication forces on the crown are extreme in the posterior. Very little surface for bonding. Over time, there's gonna be play in the crown and the screw is gonna start to become loose and looser and looser. Um, and, and that play can actually cause damage um, to the crown, to the abutment, and potentially the implant um, if it, that situation is not addressed. So we can make wiser choices um, just like this customer did when customizable parts are on hand and readily available. So with every one millimeter of abutment height you have increases the bond strength by 25%. So you know, why wouldn't I want to increase the bond strength by 75% um, on that tallest crown, right? Um, why wouldn't we want to do that? And if the option is there and it's on hand and, you know, it, it couldn't be easier, right? So better bond equals uh, less leverage and movement. You decrease the likelihood of damage and loose screws. This directly affects the patient's safety and satisfaction, along with your remakes, uh, your re remake percentage and profitability and reputation too, right? I mean, you don't want crowns coming back all the time. So we talked about um, when there is an abundance of space um, or we, um, we have a long distance to meet the uh, curve of speed or occlusion, but then we have the other extreme. I like to call this the mushroom crown. I hate them. I don't know what you call them. I call them mushroom. Um, so you're presented with minimal clearance. Doctor does not want to reduce the opposing and you call up and you get the, eh, just do the best you can. Um, you hang up the phone and we all know what that means. It means just do it. And when the patient hates it, I'll reduce and I'll send the crown back to you for a free remake. Mm, not really very fair is that. Um, if the space is five millimeters, you can simply cut the tie base to four millimeters and still have room for zirconia. I say zir zirconia uh, because that is the standard these days. Um, and one millimeter of material is sufficient. If you're doing a PFM, you know you're gonna need two millimeters. Um, if you have less than four millimeters, uh, you're going to have to be very creative with materials, but keep in mind what's best for the patient. Um, you know, maybe you shouldn't be creative. Um, maybe it isn't a screw retained crown that's needed for this case. Um, maybe the open implants, um, adjustable height tie base is not the right choice and that's okay. Um, we, we have to make the right choice above all, but at least you have components that give you um, a, a nice variety of options when those options um, are safe and effective. I understand completely that it's not easy getting the doctor's approval um, or even just to get them on the phone and get the approval to reprep or reduce. Um, but I think if we really explain better to the doctor, um, the chair time that they would save, but even more than that, they would save the patient the disappointment of leaving with a temp again when they were expecting a finished crown. Um, we might have a better chance of getting what we need to, to do the best for the patient um, if we approach it in that manner. Um, I've done a lot of chair side um, custom staining and I've been there for inserts and and I know the disappointment um, that the patient feels when they think they're finally done and they're getting their crown and they don't. Um, it, that's a, a huge disappointment for them. It, that might even cost the doctor um, a return patient because they will think, well, this doctor isn't, you know, they don't know better. And they might say, well, this doctor isn't good. I'm not going back to him. He didn't give me my crown when he said he was, you know, they don't understand everything else that goes along with that. So, you know, maybe if, if we have more candid conversations, um, both lab and doctor's life could be a little easier. So as a technician myself, 
and a very, very stubborn one in my younger days, um, I already know some of the questions you guys may have. Um, so, well, how do I cut the tie base to size? Or how do I select this in three shape? That's too complicated. I don't wanna have to search for things. Um, this is completely different from what I've done my entire career. I've done this for 30 years. I'm not changing now. I'm too old to change things. Um, so I'll address those things for you. And I apologize if I you know, offended anybody, but I feel like I can say that because I am a technician and I was pretty darn stubborn myself um, until I, I had my enlightening moment. Um, so cutting the tie base is easy. It doesn't take more than a few seconds. You're gonna use um, a double-sided diamond disc um, and just cut it to the, the pre-marked line um, of height that, that you need. Um, it really does just take a couple of seconds. Um, it only takes a couple seconds more if you wanna then go ahead and smooth in a rubber wheel. You don't have to, but I mean, it's really that quick. Um, like I said previously, the library is already preloaded with all the heights already in there. There's, there's no extra hard work for you to do. You just need to select um, the height that you are determining will support the, the crown that you have in mind. So addressing change. So most things in life evolve and become better, uh, easier to use if we take the time to learn about them, if we're open-minded. Um, think about how we, and myself, resisted zirconia 10 years ago. Um, I was like, I hate it. I'm just gonna, I just wanna build and contour for the rest of my life. And believe me, I miss building and contouring porcelain, but it's, it's almost not needed uh, anymore, uh, to be truthful. Um, Today, we have unbelievable aesthetics and strength along with easier ways for shading and centering. So everything evolves. Um, we have to be open. We just have to be open to change and experiencing um, products that might make our lives easier and by making our lives easier, more profitable. Um, you know, times are hard with, with the lab. There's, you know, a lot of competition with with pricing so we have to do everything that we can do to stay profitable and so this is one way to not only give you a great product but to help you be profitable as well um, how many of you how many of you have that uh drawer full of implant parts i call it the junk drawer i have one at home i had one when i was at the lab um, parts that were ordered because you might need them but you haven't used them in years, but should you really toss them out? Because what if you do and then you need one and you've just thrown money down the drain because you've already paid for these, these implant parts. Um, you've invested in them. They're holding up your money and they're sitting in a junk drawer. Um, that's, you could be doing better things with those funds um, or using those funds for, um, you know, whatever the laboratory might need in another area. So looking back on what we discussed about tie base height, I just wanna reiterate, even if there's no opposing, so we still need um, proper height to accommodate curve of speed, and you still have to consider the crown height space even if there's no opposing. When we have to, these are, sorry, these are just some tips, um, quick tips um, that could help you through the process. So one important tip um, is when you do have to customize a tie base, it is always best to enter the height in three shape and design. It's best not to cut the actual tie base until you have design approval. Um, whether it's your own approval or the doctor's approval, um, you can always change a design very easily. But once you've cut the tie base too short, it is what it is. Um, if you need to cut it shorter, no problem. But if you've already cut it 
too short and now you've decided you need a little more height you've you know you haven't necessarily wasted it you could use it on another restoration but um you've had you've made unnecessary alterations so just wait until you have the approval um, when it's time for bonding um, we do strongly uh, recommend um, mono bond. Use the primer and then use the multi-link cement. I, the primer really does um, help with, with etching and retention. Uh, same thing goes for when you're using a temp cylinder and PMMA. Um, it is also very beneficial with PMMA to put some retention grooves in the PMMA itself in the areas that's going to be bonded. Um, this will keep the temp from falling out before the final restoration is done. And you know, sometimes they're wearing that temp for quite some time. Um, the technique I use is I use a high speed uh, with a burr that has a ball on the end of it. Um, and I just go in and I, I lightly put in uh, some notches and the retention from those notches and the cement, the mechanical retention, uh, really helps the longevity of that temporary. So now I would like to move on and I want to talk about gingival or cuff height, um, depending on what you, you refer to it as. But depending on the depth of the implant and emergence profile, once again, you there's a lot of options you may need. And so we offer three options to accommodate your needs. Um, in the photo here, for example, we have um, the open implants compatible with Zimmer tie base, and that comes in a 0 0.85, 1.5 millimeter, and a 3 millimeter cuff, again, depending on what your needs are, and each of those are customizable chimney height. So why is the cuff important? One reason is Gum tissue cannot attach itself to titanium. Titanium is still uh, an amazing choice for an implant. Uh, bone will osseo integrate to the implant and titanium is great also um, for the abutment, um, but tissue does not attach itself to titanium in the way that it does to natural dentition. So, um, if we look at the photo here on the left, left side of the, the tooth, uh, the gum tissue is attached by collagen fibers to natural root. In an implant, it is more of a suction. So if we look at the fibers on the left versus the right, um, the fibers on the right are vertical. Um, and they get nice and uh, snug up to the, tit the titanium. Um, and it's more of a suction than a bond. Um, and we wanna have good suction. We want the tissue to be nice and snug. We wanna keep that area clean. Um, the smoother the emergence profile, the better the suction. So open implants tie bases are already pre-polished and they're the ideal texture to support gum health, um, tissue health, um, as long as you're not you know, roughening them up or, uh, you know, altering them, um, we are providing you the perfect surface for um, ideal tissue health. So what happens when we don't have uh, the ideal surface? So a smooth finish facilitates mechanical cleaning and prevents plaque buildup as well. The plaque will cause irritation, inflammation, and result in periodontal issues. Yes, you can still have periodontal issues if you have an implant. So you would see receded gums at first. Um, ever see a beautiful smile ruined by exposed metal um, resulting from tissue recession? I've seen it on implants. I've seen it on old crowns with metal collars. Um, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. Um, but there are, there are plenty of studies that show um, Numerous studies, an abutment with a smooth surface not only facilitates mechanical cleaning, but less plaque accumulation has also been observed compared to abutments with a rough surface. 
So start off ideal. Okay. So aside from the surface and the texture um, being ideal, various um, options in cuff height allow you to create the perfect emergence profile. Um, without having to design and outsource for a custom abutment. So it's not an option for every single case. Um, you know, uh, maybe the cuff works with the height um, you have to fill in, but maybe not the circumference, right? So if it's best that instead of a tie base, uh, you go with a custom abutment where you can design the cuff to completely um, fill in the tissue area, you know, maybe that's the way to go. But there are a large amount of cases where if you have um, available cuff heights and um, the ability to adjust the chimney, you can actually create something that you would have had to invest time, money, maybe you're outsourcing it, um, and you can get that case done much more efficiently, um, cost, keeping costs down and using tie bases that you have on hand. Um, so again, not one thing is you know, acceptable for every restoration, but this definitely gives you a wider range of um, freedom and variety choice. Another benefit of having the correct huff, cuff height um, is the ability to, ability to determine the cementation line. So the cementation line, in my opinion, ideally be one millimeter below the crest of the ridge. And I think that's what we all strive for. Even if we're designing a custom abutment, we're one millimeter below the crest of the ridge. Although, Industry standards are one to three millimeters below crest of ridge to ensure proper emergence profile and, and cleaning. Um, but again, there's many studies showing the deeper the cement line, the harder it is to clean and the bacteria leads to tissue and bone recession. So four millimeters deep is basically impossible to clean. So we wanna stay between one and three, but Honestly, ideally, like I know I'm not, again, I'm not a, I'm a doctor, but I know in my heart, one millimeter, that's really where it should be. Um, so screw retained crowns show superior results over cemented crowns um, because cement is not biocompatible with tissue. And so the photos that I'm showing you here are cemented crowns. I can't tell if they're on stock abutments or custom abutments. Um, but they were cemented. Cement is hard to control uh, in the office. Um, usually more cement is um, used than needed because you wanna make sure it's you know, completely filled and sealed. So you wanna see the cement express out uh, the bottom and then now you have to clean it up. Um, and it's not always to clean, not always easy to clean. It's not easy working in the oral environment. So since these days I work from home and I have to rely on old samples I've collected along the way and, and photos provided by customers. Um, well, that's unless anyone in the Colorado slash Denver area wants to invite me uh, to get my hands dirty at your lab, wink, wink, I'm totally available for that. Um, what I have here is an old case I found, not fabricated with open implant parts. Um, this is just as an example. It was a good example that I found. So I'll admit it's a beautiful screw tan crown. I, I picked it up off the model and I was like, damn, this is nice. Um, the emo emergence profile was great uh, along with the aesthetics. But once I removed the screw tan crown from the model, um, I recognized the base that was used. And at the time, cuff height wasn't an option uh, for the system being used. So let's talk about this case. Um, the implant was 4.5 millimeters deep in the tissue. There is no cuff height on the, the tie base. So that means that the cementation line 
is also 4.5 millimeters um, deep in most areas. Um, we know that the patient can't clean that deep. Um, we also know that we haven't provided um, a, an ideal smooth surface for the tissue to suction up against. Um, and we've already talked about that the ideal um, is one to three millimeters. So was this the best choice for the patient? I'm glad it was a sample case. Um, I don't know, was it the, was it the best choice? Um, I'm a huge fan of the office and my friend Dwight says, mm, he's not really sure. So, um, like we said, cement lacks biocompatibility, bio can't spit the words out, um, with tissue. Therefore, a screw retained crown is preferred over directly bonded. Um, but it's really also very important to have the right uh, emergence and, and surface for those screw retained crowns. Um, we definitely can clean those better at the laboratory. We can make sure that the crown is fully seated on the abutment, um, that there is no excessive uh, cementation line gap. Um, so if I look at the uh, sample case, and I, I took it completely off the model, and I happen to have some OI tie bases on hand, and so I put the various heights in the tissue um, to see what would be best. And so with this one, uh, the top photo shows uh, what it looks like with the 3.5 millimeter cuff. Um, the cuff brings the tie base all the way up. Um, I'm about um, a little over, a little under one millimeter at the crest of the ridge um, in different areas. And I know that my cementation line is not gonna be buried um, four and a half millimeters deep like the previous crown. Um, so if we look at the previous crown, I've kind of, I've highlighted in yellow where the cuff would have been and the height of the tie base that I, I would have selected. Um, in reality, there is no cuff. So that surface there is, probably not ideal for the tissue health. Um, and being that that's a molar, it is an upper, it's the maxillary. It, the mandibular takes the most force, but obviously a maxillary molar is, is taking a lot of force as well. So I would have wanted a tie base that was gonna give me um, really uh, secure and, and the most retention I could get. Um, and so I would feel confident um, about the quality and longevity of that restoration. So that's what I would have done um, if the OI parts were available at the time, or if I had to um, work on this case today, those would be my, my choices. And my friends over at Dunder Mifflin absolutely agree with me. And they would say, take advantage of what is, um, now readily available. So we have adjustable chimney height, we have options for cuff height. Um, but beyond that, they are 510k cleared and cleared to the FDA's current standards. These are not parts that were cleared, you know, 10 years ago, maybe to more lax standards. Um, our we work very closely with the FDA. We put a lot of time, a lot of work, passion, dedication into making sure that what we're providing um, exceeds the standards um, and may even exceed the standards of the, the, uh, the OEIs, sorry, OEMs. So, um, you know, as we come towards the end of the webinar, there's just a couple of tips that I wanted to share. You know, there's some things that we can do in the laboratory to really um, ensure success. And I'm sure that most of you know these, um, but if you're new to doing implants, maybe you don't. So having a narrow um, occlusal table, no lateral forces and excursion, decrease your cusp height, 
um, occlusal contact um, in the central fossa and not on your marginal ridges. You don't want uh, torquing. Uh, minimize cantilevers, occlusal guards if parafunction is present, so maybe they need a night guard. Um, increased abutment diameter, so make sure you have enough diameter or um, area for proper bonding and support. And um, on the doctor side, evaluating and adjusting occlusion during recall exams. Um, and make sure you have mutually protected um, occlusion. On the doctor's side, um, there's some things that they need to consider, um, such things as, you know, cantilevers are not a good option. Um, they want, when they're placing that implant, to be considerate of the crown height space. Um, you know, maybe some bone grafting should be done to eliminate some of the height. The higher the, higher the crown height space, um, the more likely a, a failure, especially on that first molar. Uh, they need to make sure the abutment is fully seated. If not, that could absolutely cause the screw to loosen. They want to make sure that they have torqued it properly. Um, and uh, well, implant position, but that was during the pre-planning, um, not while they're seating. And then um, the ideal torque technique. And this is um, really what I I want to stress, if I can stress one thing um, to you to make the patient's experience a good one, and you can't totally control this, but at least you can be proactive and try to help the situation, um, please give the doctor the IFU for the component. Pass it along. Maybe they will look at it, maybe they won't, but if they do, you've done a really great thing, because what if they are unsure about the torque? or they think they're using one thing and they're using another. Mistakes happen. Um, the correct torque has to be used. Um, over or under torquing is going to lead to damage of the screw, possibly the implant abutment, um, possibly the implant. So this is something I, I didn't know and I'll totally admit to it, but how many of you knew that the screw needs to be retightened 10 minutes after the first torque? Um, I did not know that. Um, and if you want to read the full article um, about why um, that's important, I do have the link on here for you. Um, and it, it did come out of um, dentistry today. So once the, the screw is torqued, um, there is a little give after 10 minutes. I'm assuming the, the ligaments kind of relax a little. And so it is um, recommended that the doctor go in and retorque once more to the same um, torque measurement um, that is on the IFU and that they torqued it to the first time. Um, but after 10 minutes, they should go back in and just uh, make sure that it is fully torqued. Um, if you don't want to send the IFU because you're using parts that are not 510K cleared, or maybe you just don't want the doctor to, I don't know, maybe you just don't want to share that information. Honestly, um, I would recommend switching to open implant components that are cleared under the, the tightest um, quality regulations from the FDA, the most current. Um, and if you need a device history, that can be provided on request. Um, open implants uh, designs um, and controls all of our implant accessories. So they're not third party. Um, these are our products. We control them and we you know, take huge steps um, in ensuring that they're the best um, that that you can, best that you can get. Um, and it is our obligation professionally, but beyond professionally, morally, right? Um, to give the appropriate information to ensure success and provide components that have been cleared as safe and effective, um, leaving nothing to chance. I, I would, feel good saying 95% of dental technicians 
um, do lead with their heart um, and they do want to do the morally correct thing. I've heard it in the lab all the time, you know, but this isn't going to work out for the patient. Oh, this poor patient. I'm glad that's not going in my mother's mouth. Like we do care about these things. Um, and so all I'm saying is, you know, let's take every precaution we can and, and give the doctors, the IFU, ensure that they're torquing it properly. If they don't, the patient comes back, they're retorquing it. Um, that, that case is going to end up at some point being a remake for you and, and a pain for the patient. It's, it's not fair. Um, so we should be doing everything we can to set not only the doctor and the patient up for success, but it's setting you up for success too. So I hope that you enjoyed the webinar. And more importantly, I hope I was able to bring you valuable and useful information. You can expect more webinars to come. Um, I would like to cover not only implants, open implants education, but also provide guidance on materials and processes to complete the restoration that uh, you're using your open implant components for. Um, again, leaving nothing to chance. Why? Because I am passionate about our products, but even more passionate about, passionate about delivering a total solution um, for total satisfaction. And I'm a technician. I, I want to help. Um, it's really gratifying to be able to share small tips and tricks along the way that can sometimes really um, affect a, a a technician's or a laboratory's success in significant ways, even though it was just one little missing piece of the puzzle. Um, I also um, can't wait to share some exciting news at Lab Day. Um, maybe we have some new products we'd like to announce. Um, hint, hint. Um, I really, you know, we've we haven't been to a live show in two years. I think we're gonna come back uh, with an amazing show this year. I'm actually looking forward to it. Um, I've complained for the last maybe eight years that, man, I wish I didn't have to go this year. I just need a break. It's so much work. It's so taxing, um, but I, I didn't realize I'd miss it so much. So um, I'm actually really excited to be there. Um, and super excited to be there with my teammates, um, Matt Brewer, Prudence Townsend, and of course, our CEO, Greg Gelman. I really hope you guys come by the booth um, and, and see what we have to show you. <clears throat> and just to catch up and say hello. So um, I do also want to say, be on the lookout for more education. Like I said, there's things that I'd, I'd like to present and do webinars on. And I definitely would love to hear your recommendations as to um, what you would be interested in. So when you start to see those emails coming in, um, I just want to say it's not spam. It really is. It's me, Pam. Um, so, and that's me on the bottom picture being me. That's just me, Pam. So I really, um, I thank you and I look forward to more education. And at this point, um, we are ready to answer some questions. Um, I do see that there have been some uh, questions entered along the way. Um, let me just get to those for you. Um, one of the questions was, are we going to provide more platforms? Um, Yes. Will we have angled screw channels? Um, yes, coming in 2020. We actually have um, quite a big list of components we will be adding um, to our, um, our available solutions. Um, we don't release anything until it is completely FDA cleared. Um, and I know it's, it's been a while um, since we've released some new products, but we, have, we are making up for lost time. And um, we really have a lot to show um, and talk about um, in Chicago. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about it. Um, 
I can't wait to, to talk more about it in detail. Um, I strongly encourage you guys to, to come by the booth and see what we have and have discussions about it. So yes, we will have angled screw channels, uh, more platforms. Um, let's see, we got some more questions. So yes, um, the webinar will be available um, shortly and we will email you the link for that um, and you'll be able to rewatch it if there's anything that you missed or um, if you weren't able to get in uh, on time and you missed the few first slides. Uh, let's see, what else? So will we have wider platforms? So at the moment, um, we don't, but what we strive for, what we do, what we live for um, is providing um, safe FDA cleared parts that are actually needed in the industry, right? So we are listening to what you want. Um, we've made changes to our inventory based on customer input. Um, our desire is to pr provide what you need, um, not manufacture something and then tell you that you need it. Um, we wanna give you what you need. Um, there's, there's no point in manufacturing something that, you know, isn't, there's no demand for, or you, it's not the best choice. Um, that's not, um, it's just not good for open implants and it's not good for the customers, right? Why would we want to give you something or try to convince you that you want something that you don't necessarily need or want, right? So yeah, we rely on our customers. Um, we hear your voice and we really strongly take that into consideration as to what we will think about releasing next. Um, see, I will wait a couple minutes, um, see if we have any more questions. Um, so I have a shout out from my friend, Chris. Hi, Chris. I really appreciate you, um, tuning in today and I hope Andrea is with you as well. Thank you, Greg. Um, I, you know, it was a little hard after a year off, uh, the nerves set in. I think no matter how many times you do a webinar, that's just kind of a natural thing. Um, but again, um, oh, thank you, Tim. Um, Tim has used over 60 open implant um, tie bases with great results and um, he is looking forward to more brand coverage, which yes, we have coming. I promise you it's on its way. 2022 is going to be a huge year. Um, you will be quite pleased and we will be able um, to be a more complete provider for you. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, you can do one-stop shopping um, with us and um, you know, we're always here to support you. We would do our best. Um, I am a technician and I have to say Prudence um, and Matt, who are your sales support, even though they are not officially technicians, I have to say they really know their stuff. I'm quite impressed with them. So there's a lot that they can help with as well. Um, their experience in dental and their desire to not just sell products, but actually to understand and learn. Um, is is above and beyond so um yes i'm here for technical questions but just know that those two have a lot of the answers um and they have the right answers themselves so i think that's really wonderful as well and we're all here to support you um let's see if we have any more questions coming in all right um, if you did not feel comfortable asking um, a question in this platform or on this platform, um, definitely reach out to us and we will do everything with that we can um, to answer your questions or whatever your needs are, um, because that's, that's what we do. Um, thank you all so much for um, 
taking time out of your very busy day to, to hear me talk. And I hope that you return uh, and watch our um, upcoming educational webinars and also watch out for the blogs that we have. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful Thursday and a wonderful weekend coming up. Thank you. Now, see you soon.